What uh, an amazing coincidence that at just the same time, roughly, that we're able to finally develop interplanetary spacecraft and space probes that we could rocket to the other side of the solar system uh, to take data and measurements and uh, send that back to Earth, that the outer planets of the solar system, uh, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, would be have just the right alignment, that they'd all be in the same part of the solar system, that we could send a single spacecraft and shoot by all four. That alignment only happens once every 200 years or so. So if in the 60s and 70s, when we started to, to develop interplanetary spacecraft, if we were just at the wrong end of that cycle, you know, maybe we'd get a mission to Jupiter, uh, maybe a mission to Saturn. But Uranus and Neptune, would, if, if they're on the far end of the solar system, it's just not happening. It's just not feasible to send a spacecraft out there. But everything lined up just right so that we could send, in this case, two missions, the Voyager missions, uh, racing past Jupiter and Saturn, giving them a gravity boost uh, so they accelerate, go a little bit faster, and get them in the right place at the right time to visit Uranus and Neptune. Only one of the spacecraft did that. I think it was Voyager 2 that went to all four. We had Voyager 1 visit Jupiter and Saturn and then look at Titan, one of the moons of Saturn, a bit longer. And so that cost it the ability to go on to uh, Uranus and Neptune. Uh, the scientific return from these missions was enormous. Like, like the same level of excitement and wonder and awe and intrigue that we had from the New Horizons mission to Pluto it's been 40 years since we last had that sensation. Yes, there were the Pioneer missions, but uh, let's face it, they had pretty crap crappy cameras, you know, not the highest quality scientific gear. The Voyager missions were fully loaded. We had more experience, uh, more design, a better technology. We could pack as much punch into these spacecraft, which are no bigger than like a small car, by the way. I feel that's important to point out. It's, it's amazing what these missions returned. Like just opened our eyes to the gas giants and the ice giants of, of our own solar system, our own backyard. But even though their planetary mission ended in 1989, they're still out there. They're still collecting data. They're still communicating with Earth. They're still active. They are... Uh, 13 billion miles from the sun, that is, it's, it's honestly hard to put that into perspective of just how far away that is. At these distances, the sun is barely another star. It's, it's, a, it's a slightly brighter point of light in a field of an almost endless field of stars. That is the distances we're talking about. And they're still active, but not for long. They uh, will run out of power in about the year 2025. That's when we project. They're already in super low power mode. They're not taking pictures anymore. They're barely collecting data. They have just enough to collect a little bit of data and beam that information back to Earth uh, through radio, low power radio. This is, uh, by 2025, the radiothermal generators the uh they have a pile of nuclear material that radioactively decays some plutonium uh it decays heats up a, a, a semiconductor and that semiconductor use the fact that it's hot on one side cold on the other to generate a flow of electrons which generates electricity that's what powers these spacecraft solar power is not an option at these distances and that's how they're powered but then once you run out of nuclear material to decay, that's it, no more power. And so we project in, in about the year 2025, that's it. So that means no more communication with the spacecraft. Already, already these spacecraft have pushed new boundaries. Both spacecraft have crossed what we call the helio sheath and one, Voyager 1, is in interstellar space. And this is defined to be, there, there's a few different definitions you can use for interstellar space, but uh, the definition that's used in the case of, uh, for here, and, and, it's, and it totally works, is 
where the particles that we call the solar wind, these are charged particles constantly raining out of the sun. Uh, they, they flood the solar system when they hit the earth. This is what gives us the aurora. These are traveling outwards from the sun. And there's a point where that transition, like the stuff that's spit out by the sun itself, meets the general galactic milieu, the mixture of every, all the other interstellar junk in the galaxy. And so there's a there's actually a shock, a termination shock. There's a bow. There's a, there's a distinct change in atmosphere, in, in the quality of, of interstellar space, where it goes from being dominated by the sun, the output of the sun itself with these charged particles, to being dominated by the general mixture of interstellar space in our galaxy. Voyager 1, uh, so Voyager 2 is kind of in the boundary zone, which is what we call the helio sheath. Voyager 1 has crossed that and its environments, its sampling, this is kind of cool to think about, it's, it's taking data about truly interstellar space. It's our only spacecraft, our only spacecraft ever to do that. Eventually Voyager 2 will catch up, eventually New Horizons will catch up, but for now it's the only spacecraft, the only thing created by humanity to reach interstellar space. And we're still communicating, we are learning today, 40 years after the launch of the mission, we are still mining that data. We're still learning about this boundary beyond our own solar system. Hey, it's me again. I know you just watched a few minutes of me, but who couldn't use a little bit more me? I'm just here to beg you to please subscribe. And if I remember, there's going to be a button like right here uh, where I'm vaguely gesturing. So if you like what you just saw, uh, you'll get more of it if you subscribe. Super easy.